All right, uh, we're on board the Patience flatboat and with Brinker Buck on the Ohio River. And what is the date today? Uh, is... Today's the 16th, and we've done. Uh, uh, we're, we're up around 260, 270 miles so far in exactly a week. So that's a really good rate. We're we're very pleased with our progress. So tell us about the boat and tell us about the project. Sure. When I was finishing up uh, the Oregon Trail book that I, the Oregon Trail book that I wrote, um, I learned that the pioneers would get to Oregon, and their wagons were in such poor shape, and the only thing they had to do now was get down to uh, the Columbia River to Portland. So there were services there. There were little makeshift services there. Little we call them pop-up stores now, and they would offer to take the Pioneer's wagon apart and turn it into a boat. Uh, actually, they were building big commercial boats there. Right. And they would turn it, um, <clears throat> turn the wagon lumber into a big bateau or boat that in those days, the Columbia River wasn't dammed, so they would raft it down over the rapids. And people, a lot of Pioneers actually arrived on the Pacific coast that way. And I became curious about it, and I read, well, they were just doing what they've already been doing in America for uh, the entire 19th century, which was they would build a flatboat up in Indiana or Ohio, even Michigan somewhere, float it down their local river to the drainage to the Mississippi, take it to New Orleans. And when they got to New Orleans, they even made a profit on the lumber because they, so it was a floating lumber yard that was going down the Mississippi, plus all their crops, the coal, corn and so forth. That movement of people, those 20,000 people a year who worked uh, on the Mississippi River, the Ohio River and so forth, uh, were the backbone of the American economy and they created the global economy, the global competition that we have today. Because all of America's products, and not all of it, but uh, 50 or 60 percent of America's products were going out through New York. New Orleans after a Mississippi trip. So I got real interested in that and I started reading up on it and one thing led to another. I mean it, it is kind of a disease I have but uh, I just said well you know why not float the river like they did. I'm not a reenactor. I don't want to create everything just the way it was. You can't do that. This Ohio River is damned now. But I can see the towns and visit the history get a sense of what it's like to be on a boat all day. We went, uh, what, 12 hours today? Yep. Uh, we went uh, 13 and a half hours today. Uh, and it's it's tiring, it's, it's a lot of work. And so I'm getting a sense of what those flatboat men who created the American economy, helped create the American economy, were going through. And now you have to deal with dams and locks. Lots of Really them. fascinating, I mean, uh, this is not a wild river. No, but I love it when people criticize government and say government doesn't do us any good. There's a huge system of locks all the way up the river. We're going to go through 25 of them just on the Ohio alone. Maintained at huge expense. I mean, every time we went through one of those locks, I boat here, big enough for a huge barge and everything, all that expense, everything that was happening, was done just to get us uh, down to the next le level of the river. Um, but that is what keeps the Ohio and the Mississippi as commerce for America. There's, there it is, there it is. What, what do we got there? We got a petroleum barge, we got a coal barge, I don't know what's covered up there. And 50 or 60 of these work in the river right as we speak. That's the American economy right there. And the, and the lock system supports that. And so it was great. Uh, it wasn't my first time in a lock. I did take a lock a couple times uh, up uh, between uh, Albany and Lake, Lake Champlain, the old uh, Erie Canal system. But I've uh, never been in such a massive lock. And you, and you go in and there's a whole procedure and they sound a whistle and you get a green light. Today was actually a significant day because when we went through the Racine lock, um, that was my first lock that, yeah. I did, that I did all myself. They even, you know, I looked around and nobody was with me. I was all alone up, up here on the bridge. So we got through the lock fine. Um, how'd you get the boat? Where's the boat come from? The boat comes from Cooper Flatboats in Gallatin, Tennessee. Uh, there's a character that I think you've already interviewed named John Cooper. 
and he's just uh, sui generis, one of a kind. Just a great southern, backslapping, fun-loving river man with great stories and everything. And he's been building these flatboats to actually go down the rivers. He's been to New Orleans two or three times. And he builds replicas, uh, static flatboats, not a floating hull, but uh, for museums. So kids can go and see what the flatboat era was all about. Uh, and I moved on to his farm in Gallatin, Tennessee in the end of February and just worked straight on through until a week ago when we hauled the boat by a big tr uh, tractor trailer to uh, Pittsburgh. The trip I'm replicating is or, or following was one made by uh, Jacob Yoder in 1783. He was a Revolutionary War veteran. He was a, a veteran of the Continental Army. He came back just as the war was ending and he uh, he had a very good crop that year and he, he knew that the markets in Philadelphia and so forth were saturated. Oh. He knew that the markets in Philadelphia and New York were saturated. So what he did was um, he uh, had his milled grain hauled on something called the National Road uh, all the way over to the Monongahela, over the Alleghenies to the Monongahela River at Brownsville which was the old Red Fort, they called it. It was an old colonial fort. He had a flatboat built by local people. He took it down to New Orleans. He took it 2,000 miles down to New Orleans. He's believed to be the first to go that far. And at New Orleans, he sold his uh, grain for script, for uh, beaver pelts. Uh, New Orleans was a Spanish possession then. Uh, went to Cuba, cashed in the script, and got his beaver pelts, brought them back to uh, Baltimore by sea, and uh, made a $2,000 profit on the whole trip, uh, including breaking up the flatboats for sidewalks in, in New Orleans. And uh, $2,000 in those days was a lot of money. And word spread, and before you knew it, uh, by the turn of the century, there were 80, 100, 200, uh, big flatboat, some of them 100 feet long, going down with the products of the Midwest. This is what allowed the Midwest to develop. They had a place to take their product, an international port, New Orleans, and it was cheap to get there because you floated. Mm -hmm. The water did the work for you. But it was dangerous. It, it was somewhat dangerous. I, I have to research more and I can't wait to sit down and write this book because there were pirates. You know, we're going to pass, pass a couple places. And at one point, uh, Thomas Jefferson, president then, early 19th century president, he was fighting the Barbary pirates uh, over in North Africa and he realized he had a bigger problem with pirates right here on the Ohio and the Mississippi. So he sent troops down and they scattered the pirates and that sort of thing. Uh, the river was wild and free then, it didn't have the dams that it has today. So you were totally de dependent on flow and rain. You could have to stop in a place like this because it was rocky and wait for a week. It had to rain up in Pittsburgh somewhere to float you, float you down, that kind of thing. How'd you put your crew together? I put my crew together the way I sort of always do things. I, I, I guess I just rely on God, but uh, John Cooper, this is his 23rd hull like this, so he knows this world. And he found a, a fellow named Scott Mandrell who uh, was the, the leader of the uh, 2003 Bicentennial Lewis and Clark Discovery Expedition. And through um, Scott, I've made all these contacts. And, and uh, even today, uh, as videos are out on YouTube and everything, as we're going down the river, everybody's taking pictures of us and posting it. I'm getting more emails, hey, can I crew for you? you know, and we just got lucky. Our first crew, the crew we launched with, Brady Carr, uh, a, a, a ex-marine who can just do anything. Uh, Jay, who uh, is the colorful one with the pirate hat and the, the old-fashioned attire. Um, he's great at roping up at night, uh, running errands, going into town. He knows how to run the boat. He, he came on board the boat with uh, 300 pounds of tin food. And it's... Um, it's my style of food. It's great food. It's not Danny Corjulo style of food. He does all the cooking and Danny's our little 
you know, our little kitchen maid, you know. Uh, and uh, and even Jay appreciates it. He says, this is a lot better food than I was going to give you, you know. So you just get lucky. I think, I think what it is is you take a risk. You say, hey, I'm going I'm to do this. And all of my friends consider me nuts. All of my brothers, you know, the brothers who have experience in the Coast Guard and they've been in boats and everything, they're all telling me, you're going to kill yourself down there, you know. Everybody's negative. And you just say to yourself, you know, I'm just going to do this thing. We'll see how it works out. And goodness comes to you. Like, we were low on fuel tanks. We needed more fuel tanks. We stopped the other day. I think it was in Sisterville, West Virginia. And the guy running the marina said, well, look, i got a barn full of old tanks at home. Why don't you come with us? And, and Brady went over with him in his pickup, and and by the and Brady went to work on him. You know, the guy was going to ask 10 or 15 bucks a tank for the thing. And Brady went to work on him, saying, you know, like, well, a patriotic American would would donate these tanks, you know. And we got free tanks, free gas tanks. So we ran, uh, Danny, I think we ran 54 miles today, which is pretty darn good on the river. Now, you have an engine in it. And, you, and we do have an engine. Yeah, required by the Coast Guard. And well, it's required by the Coast Guard because if you, if you just floated free and you got out of control and you got in the way of those big barges, they would take you off the river. Yeah. But second of all, this is not the same river. Um, the Ohio River and then the Mississippi River in the uh, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s was a wild and free river. There were no dams, there were no levees, there was no water control at all. And now, of course, for hydroelectric, uh, to make a better trench, a uh, water trench for all the barge traffic and so forth, there are dams. And actually, the, the river is called a pool. Between each dam, between the two dams, it, it's called a pool. Uh, and the water is controlled and released and so forth, depending on rain and how much energy they need and that sort of thing. So uh, you need a motor because it, the river isn't flowing really fast, although the lower Mississippi, when we get to it in about a month or six weeks from now, there are spots, it, it, it is free, there's no dams there, and there are spots where we're going to be doing uh, 15 miles an hour with the current, with the motor turned on. So, but we, but we need the motor for safety now, and also the Coast Guard wouldn't let us stay on the river if we, didn't, if we couldn't propel ourselves out of the way of commercial traffic.